Samuel 20 is a fascinating chapter here we see as David is on the run. Now if you remember in the previous chapter, Saul was with Samuel. He was prophesying. He had sought to kill David, sent some men after him. They, started be, they were filled with the Holy Spirit when they went to the congregation. That happened three times in a row. So finally Saul went himself and the Lord overshadowed him and Saul recognized his error and shamed himself by taking off his clothes and he's you know, preaching, but he's proclaiming what was right and what was wrong. So while he was there with Samuel, David flees and that's where this chapter picks up. David then goes to his best friend who is Jonathan and they start this conversation. Your dad wants to kill me. No, he doesn't. If he did, I would know. And he says, no, I'm telling you he does. I'm almost dead. And he says, here's what we'll do. We'll figure it out uh, when it comes time that we all meet for dinner I'm going to you know figure it out and if I see that my dad wants to kill you I'll show a sign I'll shoot arrows if it's beyond you that means you need to go if it's short of you it's okay to come in that's the long and the short of this chapter and it all begins to happen but it's important to point out we talked a couple weeks ago I believe it was in chapter 18 so two weeks ago about how great of a friend Jonathan was, how great of a person Jonathan was. Jonathan, since the very introduction, there's been nothing but great things said about him. One of the young men came to me and said, I I've added uh, one of my favorite characters in the Bible to be Jonathan now, after hearing how he, would, he was not afraid. He went and fought for the Lord, even when there was very few people there. And so he continues to stand for what's right. Chapter 18, he went to his father and told his father, hey, what, what did David do? He didn't do anything wrong. If there's a just cause, that's one thing. And his father repented and his father sorrowed. And he said, you're right. He has been good to me. And you're right. I shouldn't hurt him. We're going to see some of that come back. But this time we're going to see a different response from Saul. Saul is continuing to harden his heart. But what's neat here about Jonathan is Jonathan is like the perfect best friend. And I want to talk about best friends or friendship tonight as we look at Jonathan. If you would look at the first Let's look at the first couple verses. Uh, verse number one, And David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done, or what is mine iniquity, and what is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? And he said unto him, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. And David swear moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. David is saying, listen, you don't know Jonathan. I'm telling you, he's trying to kill me. And it's like, what? I'm one step away from dying. I mean, a person that could say that would be one that's on the edge of a mountain trying to walk around, or on the edge of a volcano, or about to fall into some water, or the enemy's right there pointing an arrow at them. And that's where David was. He's like, he, this is so close. He keeps trying to kill me. I'm one step away. Away from dying. I mean, that's got to be a scary place to be. Verse 4, Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. Jonathan demonstrates himself here as being a great best friend. Now this is very important. I, as I read this, I thought, man, Jonathan's great. I wish I had a friend like Jonathan. And then the Lord convicted me, and He says, no, 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 no. Why don't you have a desire to be a friend like Jonathan? Jonathan really does demonstrate all the characteristics of Christ. He's laying his life down for others. He's serving others. He's fighting battles for others. He's being a blessing to people. He's instructing them in righteousness. I mean, Jonathan is phenomenal. Uh, a few weeks ago, I talked about instead of that old song, Dare to Be a Daniel, we talked about Dare to Be a David. And as I think about this, it's like, man, dare to be a best friend like Jonathan or better than this. Let me tell you about my best friend. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There is no friend like Jesus. I know we sing songs about that and we read about it and it is awesome to be able to have a friend that loves you so much that they've laid their life down for you and yet I want to encourage you as a Christian, you're saved, you're going to heaven no matter what at this point. Now, if you believe the Bible, why, why won't you try to be Jesus' best friend? See, we have a pride problem. 
I'm the superhero of my story. I'm the David. And so are you. But God wants us to see others as the David. To see others as the superhero. And it's okay if you're just the sidekick or the doorkeeper or the servant or the slave. We're not here for our glory. And in God's kingdom, everything's upside down. In this world, uh, there are certain names I could name of famous actors or musicians or politicians, and everybody would know what they did. Or businessmen, we would know what they did and how much money they're worth and how great their empire was. But in God's book, you know, there are some unnamed prophets that we won't know their name until we get to heaven. And God magnifies them as they were a great person because they served Him. We live in an upside down kingdom. And God wants us, I believe, to be like Christ by trying to be a best friend like Jonathan. Not trying to say, I'm a David and I need some Jonathans around me, but rather saying, you know what? I want to be a Jonathan to people in need. I want to help be a supporting person. I don't want to be the lead. Jonathan had this characteristic. It was phenomenal how God was able to use him. Flip ahead to verse number 12. 1 Samuel 20, verse number 12, it says, And Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about, time, about tomorrow any time or the third day, and behold, if there be any good toward David, then I will send not unto thee and show it to thee. It's interesting that he's talking to David, but he's talking to the Lord. He's making a promise to his best friend, but he's doing it before the Lord. He's swearing before the Lord as, hey, before God, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do what's right for your life. Verse 13, the Lord's do so, and much more to Jonathan, but if it please my father to do thee evil, then I will show it thee and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace. And the Lord be with thee as he hath been with my father. He says, if my dad's going to hurt you and I find out, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to stick up my, for my dad because that's wrong. I'm going to stick up for what's right, and that's to save your life. God was with my father, and I want God to be with you. Verse 14, and thou shalt not only while I yet live, show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not. He says, don't just be kind to me while I'm living. Verse 15, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one of them from the face of the earth. Jonathan is saying this statement, hey, be good to me while I'm alive, but do me this favor, even when I'm gone, would you still be kind to my children? Because God's going to take care of your enemies, David. And if it turns out my dad's one of your enemies, I might die in the process. And he will, and he does. And David's going to fulfill this covenant that they're making. David will uh, take care of his children. Verse 16, So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan calls David to swear again, because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Boy, now that's a good friend. Now here's what we need to do. We need to love people more than we love ourselves. It's really that simple. Is that not what Jesus did for you? If you would, turn to Proverbs 18. I want to show you something. Uh, I want to help you to see what God's will is for you in friendship. I want you to have more godly friends like Jonathan, but God's principle is not that I should go out and ask and seek for friends like that, but rather, if I make myself that kind of friend, if I make myself a Jonathan, and I serve other people, and I take care of their business, and I pray for them, and I speak well of them, then I believe God will provide great friends for me. We have it all backwards and upside down. We go out and look for the best, but God wants us to go out and be the best and do the best, and then God will take care of it on the other side. Proverbs 18, 24 is a promise. It's the last verse in Proverbs 18. He says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. When you read that, our tendency is to say, I want friends like that that will stick with me. But you know, let's read it the other way. I need to be one of those friends that will stick by those that need some help and I need to do it better than I, if I were their blood brother. That's the kind of friend God would have us to be. His promise in the first half, a man that hath friends must show himself 
friendly. If you want real friends, if you want true friends, if you want great friends, there's one way to do it that's God's way, and it's showing yourself friendly. Again, don't seek for more friends. Don't seek to be popular. Seek to be a friend. Find people that need to be encouraged and need love, that need to be lifted up and motivated and told that God loves them. Be kind. Be Christ-like. Be long-suffering. That's what a real friend would do. God wants us to demonstrate the love that He's given to us through our friendships. And instead of seeking for friendships, He said, just show yourself friendly and I'll give you some friends. I want to show you a couple Proverbs that help uh, define this and give us some insight. First, let me quote Jesus in John 15. He says, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. That's like taking a bullet. Now listen, in the marriage relationship, in the marriage covenant, the spouse ought to be the best friend. Uh, I'm going to put Brother Luke on the spot here. Him, him and Sister Minna, they did not get married and then became friends. No, no, no. They were friends for some time. In fact, uh, getting closer to becoming best friends and then they decided to get married. And that's how marriage really ought to be is that we are a team working together. We're best friends serving the Lord. But you know what a good friend does? Well, they show themselves friendly to other people. If you want a great spouse, then you have to start by being a great spouse. This is how it works. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Uh, go back to Proverbs 17. Put back to Proverbs 17. In Luke 6, Jesus said, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured unto you. That's a promise. And he's talking about when you give to other people and take care of their needs, don't worry, God's going to take care of your needs. And that same application is when you need to be encouraged and you need to be helped and you need a friend, the question is how, how much friendship are you showing? How are you showing yourself friendly to others or are you trying to be a hermit? Just leave me alone. I'm going to the woods. Nobody talk to me. I know some of us guys would be okay with that. You know, we don't uh, have quite as many emotional needs as some of the ladies, or at least we pretend like it, right? You know, I'm just me in the woods. We're good to go, right? Well, we all do have social needs. And Jesus uh, demonstrated that in Luke 2, that He was growing in stature and wisdom and uh, favor with God and man. And we ought to grow in favor with man. And we do that by showing ourselves friendly, showing ourselves loving. And if you're ever discouraged and downtrodden, here's the simple solution. Love somebody. Hug somebody's neck. Tell them how good of a friend they've been. Show yourself friendly and God will solve your problems. In Proverbs 16, you're in 17, in Proverbs 16, 28, at the end of the verse, it says, a whisperer separateth chief friends. You know what kind of friend you ought to be? Not a gossip. You know what kind of friend you ought to look for? One that's not gossiping and tearing people down but one that's speaking life and truth, right? Verse, uh, now you're in Proverbs 17. Look at verse number 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. Uh, in other words, you're being very forgiving. There's two sides to that. If somebody has hurt you and you love them, then just cover it up and don't worry about it. You forgive them and you move on. Uh, you should, he says, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. Uh, we ought to restore people where, they're, where they came from and try to help them to grow. Look at verse 17 in Proverbs 17. A friend loveth at all times, he says. When, how, at what time does he love? Sometimes. Fair weather, friend. Let me see how, the, oh, the wind's not blowing in your direction. Or, you know what it is, it's, what can I get from you? No, as a real friend, we're going to help the downtrodden. We're not going to be selfish about it. It's not just when we feel like we get something from it. Oh, I love hanging out with so-and-so because they have all the toys and they usually pay for everything and they let us go play with their toys and buy us dinner and all that kind of stuff. What kind of friend ought you ought to be? The one that says, come on over, I'm buying. Somebody, a friend that loveth at all times. 
not just for monetary reasons or for gifts or for blessings. Look at verse 18. It says, A man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. You know what he's doing? That's like, yeah, I can pay for that. I can afford that. And you know, Some people will actually go into debt because of their pride and they're willing to go into debt and strike hands for an agreement because their friends are around. What kind of friend should you be? Well, not one that's always bragging of what you can do. Not one that's uh, showing off. We ought to be humble, loving, and kind. Go to Proverbs 22. It's important for you to remember that as a Christian, you should not have wicked friends. You know, Jesus went to some really uh, so, some rough people, didn't He? Oh, well, He's hanging out with the winos and the harlots. But Jesus did not go to the bar with them. Jesus did not sit around and joke about their sin. Jesus went to them and lifted them up and spoke life into them and preached the Gospel to them and fed them and helped them. And that's the kind of friend we ought to be is that, listen, we, don't, we shouldn't be hanging around with people that have a desire just to live a wicked lifestyle. We should avoid those that want to drag us down. And we ought to be the type of friend that lifts somebody up. Years ago, somebody told me there's only two types of friends. There are those that will drag you down to their level, or there are those that are going to lift you up and pull you up to where they're at. On a professional level, I've heard people say, well, you show me your top five friends, and I'll show you, I'll take what they have and average it out, and that will show me their income, your IQ, your living standard, and that ought to scare you if two of your friends, two out of your top five are people that just don't care. They're destroying their lives. You ought to say, you know what? I don't want to allow that influence. I want to be around godly people that want to live for God, that want God's blessing on their life. There are a lot of people out there that are they're not living in the fear of the Lord. Well, we ought to make sure that we're surrounding ourselves with people that want to walk for God, that want to work for God. You're in Proverbs 22. Let me catch up. Go to verse 9. Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 9. It says, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Cast it. So that's somebody that's willing to help others when they need it. Verse 10, Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Now, he's saying, if you have a group of people and there's fighting, there's scorning and contention, arguments, we'll get rid of the argumentative person and all of a sudden the whole environment will change. Now, here's the warning to us. We ought not to be contentious. Scorning is saying negative down things. It should not be that a Christian uses their mouth to proclaim devastation was talking with somebody recently about a situation they're dealing with and there's two people involved and one said yes we can and the other one said well we'll try but if they're not willing to do it my way then you know this isn't going to work and it's like stop what you're saying is wrong you're already you're already forecasting doom proverbs 18 21 tells us that there's power of death and life in the tongue and if you go around saying negative nasty hurtful scornful things all the time then bitterness is going to grow in your heart and you're going to have a hard time recognizing the love that god has for you and the blessings that he has for you and you're just going to kind of put these blinders on and you're only going to see doom and gloom and it's terrible and it's not working my way well a lot of that's because you're deciding to say and do negative things. As a Christian, that not ought to be. He says, cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yeah, strife and reproach shall cease. If you want that to cease in your life, uh, then you have to get rid of the scornful words out of your heart. Verse 11, look at what he says about friendship here. He says, he that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips the king shall be his friend. What he's saying, a person that loves pure things, godly things, his lips will speak graceful things, and because of his heart and his lips, the king will want to be his friend. And we're talking about somebody that to have, friend, have friends, he must show himself friendly. This is a person that loves purity and speaks grace, and even the king wants to be his friend. That's the kind of power that God wants to give us, but it all goes back to what we have in our heart and what comes out of our lips. Let me read it again. Please look at it in your Bible. Please look at verse number 11. 
He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. The king will want to be your friend because of the great things that you're saying, because you're not negative and destructive with your tongue. In this same passage, look at verse 24. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shall not go. Here's the warning. Who you're around will affect your words. So if you're always hanging around somebody that's not in church, not on fire for God, not reading their Bible, they could just care less about anything. They think that all the joy that there ever is is what I get right now in this world, then that's going to affect you and it's going to change your heart. It will make you bitter and furious and disappointed. He says we shouldn't make a friendship with those types of people. We need to change who we're around if we want God's blessing on our life. Now go to Proverbs 27. Proverbs chapter 27. We're warned in the New Testament, in James 4, verse 4, it says, Ye adulteresses, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. If you're choosing to be around worldly people that don't want to be associated with God, people that never speak of how great God is, well, then that's going to affect you and it's going to make you to be a terrible friend, a miserable person. We need to talk about the joy of the Lord. We need to talk about the victories that God's given us. We need to talk about godly wisdom that comes out of His Word. We need to be encouraged with that. And it starts with you. You need to open it up for yourself and make a decision yourself. I will not submit to the destructive power of other people anymore. I want power in my life. I want victory in my life. I want to let the Holy Spirit reign in my life. And you have to do the work. Open it up for yourself. and Read it. and Let God work in your heart. Proverbs 27, look at verse number 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know what that means? Sometimes it takes a godly friend to tell you the truth. No one else is going to tell you this, but I tell you because I love you. Do what's right. Get away from the wrong people. Sometimes when a friend cuts you and wounds you. It lasts and it helps you when in a time of need. Look at verse 5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. While we're in this chapter, look at verse number 9. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Do you realize that we ought to be the kind of friend that's giving godly advice and giving godly encouragement that we're trying to encourage people to go to church encourage people to get in the bible we need this encouragement god has written us a personal letter all of our problems are solved right here and the problem is most people are just simply too stubborn to open it up for themselves and they get hard-hearted and and then somebody needs to come along and be a faithful friend and wound them and say when's the last time you were in the bible what are you reading in the bible get back in the bible are you singing unto the lord we need to encourage people for their own good. Only a real friend would do that. Verse 10, he says, Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother that is far off. God actually designed us to choose our relationships for friends and to have friends that we can help one another. Isn't it nice to be able to return a favor? Who's had to return a favor before? Who's had to call one in? Man, I've got a problem, but I know who to call. Not because they owe it to me, but because I think they think well of me and they have the ability to help me. Doesn't it feel good to be able to be that one that gets the call and goes and helps somebody? Well, that's God's will for us. In Proverbs, let's see, we're in 27. Look at verse 17. Last thing here. Proverbs 27, verse 17 Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And the countenance is your face. And your face tells on you, whether you guys know it or not. When you come in here, if you're having a bad day, guess what? Your face is telling on you. If you're having a good day, it can't be hid. Even when I'm reading a bad verse, a negative thing, you're still smiling. You're like, yeah, God's good. We don't have to put up with that. 
He's given us power and victory over those things, right? But here he says that we, as a friend, should be iron that sharpens another piece of iron. That, in other words, what are you saying? That we make somebody better. We lift them up in the Lord. We build them up and we encourage them and we motivate them and uh, we, don't, we don't tear them down. We don't destroy them with evil. That's what a real friend would do. Now go back to 1 Samuel 20. Go back to 1 Samuel 20. If you would look at verse 30. This is when Saul figured out that David um, was getting counsel from Jonathan. Verse 30, Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and to the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? What a statement. What a verse. What's he saying? He's, first of all, he insults his mother. Right? Jonathan's asking him again, why are you trying to kill David? What's going on? So Saul gets angry and he attacks his mom. And then, now if you think about this, if Saul is king today, well, logically, who's going to be the next king? Jonathan. And he's, trying, he's rebuking him, saying, hey, you're the one that's supposed to be next. You shouldn't like David. I think everybody knew that David was anointed to be king and that God's hand was on him and the people loved him and things were happening for David, which is what made Saul so angry. And now he's angry that Jonathan hasn't figured it out by now. Hey, you're supposed to hate that guy. You're shaming yourself is what he's kind of trying to say by the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. Verse 31, For as long as the son of Jesse liveth on the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now, send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. He says, you know where he's at, go get him, I'm going to kill him. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, his own son. He's so angry, he tries to kill his own son over David. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. His father was acting like a fool. His father was prophesying again of an evil spirit. And Jonathan said, I'm disappointed in him. What dad's doing is shameful. He's working for the devil. I mean, this is his response, essentially. And unfortunately, Saul is giving us a very poor example of a godly father. He's not being godly at all. He's angry. He's destroying his own house. He's destroying his friends and everybody else that helped him. Now, Jonathan, as a true friend, he's disappointed because of his shame toward David. Go to the end of the chapter. Look at verse 41. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept one with another until David exceeded. Jonathan is such a great friend that when Saul tried to kill him and David recognized it, he already knew, Jonathan comes to David and hugs him and comforts him. He's weeping, so he's weeping with him. He's mourning, so he's mourning with him. He's like knit together with him, like, I'm sorry, this is terrible. I don't know what to do. But notice he continued comforting David until, look what it says at the end of it. It says in verse 41, until David exceeded. If you want to be a true friend, you won't stop comforting somebody until they're able to turn it around. Sometimes we're stubborn when we're having a bad day. And we need a persistent friend to keep being a friend and to keep speaking truth and life and love and pointing them back to the cross, pointing them back to the Scriptures. That's the kind of friend we ought to be. If you really love somebody, you won't give up after two or three tries. 
You know how it is. Somebody will shut you down. No, no, it's good. No, I'm all right. No, I'm just fine. You keep going. Hey, listen, man, I know you're having a rough time and I would too if I were in your shoes and I just want you to know I love you and I want to see you pull this thing out. If you would go to Romans chapter 12. Go to Romans chapter 12. It says, They wept one with another until David exceeded. The last verse, as you're turning, I'll read the last verse in 1 Samuel 20. It says, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Uh, Jonathan and David will speak one more time and that will be their last conversation. This was the second to last time they'd ever see each other. And he says, go in peace. I'm going to sacrifice my relationship even with my father if I have to, to help protect you. I want you to understand. I want you to, and, you know, here's the thought. Here's the big thought for tonight. Be a friend like Jesus. You have the power to encourage people when they're down. You know, most of you that go to a workplace Every Monday morning, there's somebody with a frown, with a bad attitude, with a reason to be tired and wore out and depressed and not excited to be there. But you have the Holy Spirit. And your Holy Spirit that lives inside of you is greater than their bad day. In Romans chapter 12, look at verse 9. He says, let love be without dissimulation. In other words, don't fake your love. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. You still hate what's evil and you love what's good. Verse 10, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. So what does brotherly love look like? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. And here He's saying brotherly love is that we prefer somebody else more than ourselves. I want to make sure that you get to eat before I eat. I want to make sure that you have a good day. I'm not satisfied if you're going to end your day miserably because I'm worried about you. I'm trying to figure out what I can do to help you, to encourage you, to lift you up. Now listen, you're saved. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. This is the kind of friend that God wants you to be. There are people in the world that don't have good friends great friends. They don't have Jesus as their best friend. And you need to be a, be a best friend like Jesus where it could be said about you behind your back. There's something about them. They're different. Be kindly affectionate one to another in brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. That means excited. Serving the Lord. That's what you're known for. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Given to hospitality. I mean, these are the characteristics of the Lord. And he says, this should apply to you. Verse 14. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Didn't we just see this with Jonathan and David? Jonathan hugged his best friend and weeped with him because his life was at risk. He had already been separated from his wife. Now he's hiding in the woods, trying to figure out what to do. What does my future hold? I've just been trying to serve the Lord and do the right thing. And, and death is but one step away from me. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Verse 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Today we call that being conceited. The conceited person, they're way up here and they don't care about the people down here. But not as a Christian. As a Christian, you need to make sure that you're looking down and helping people that can't help themselves. Don't be conceited and braggadocious and full of pride. No, no. As a good friend, as Christ has been to you, that's how you ought to be to others. And that means lifting people up when they're down and discouraged. He says in verse 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as liveth in you, lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. He says, as much as you can, be peaceable. Now, uh, if somebody walks up to you and they put a pistol in your face, 
you know, maybe it's time to use some self-defense and prayer. You know, that's not really a peaceable action. You should defend yourself. That's a biblical concept. But you ought not to be a warmonger or a contentious person or argumentative. It, it shouldn't be that you're always, you know, trying to hurt people and argue with people. Rather, he says, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Now, I want you to think about this. We're almost done, and we're going to stop right here. But I want you to look at it in your Bible. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. That's easy to say, and it's hard to do. My enemy doesn't deserve to be fed, does he? My enemy deserves to suffer, doesn't he? <laughs> I want to see vengeance over his soul. Well, God will take care of vengeance, and He wants us to take care of friendship. He wants us to represent the Holy Spirit here in this world and show what Christ has done for us by even feeding those that are hungry that we would call an enemy. He says, If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. If you haven't underlined or highlighted that verse in your Bible, I want you to, and I want you to live by it. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. It's your job, the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, to not let somebody that's doing something wrong affect you. Don't let this evil world ruin your spirit. You have the power to change them with your words. Now, if Jesus tells us when it comes to our enemies how we should treat them, how do you think He wants us to treat our friends? If He tells us to love our enemies and to feed our enemies, and when they're thirsty to give them something to drink, shouldn't we be taking care of our friends? teaching them, loving them, comforting them, weeping with them. We live in a time when people are brokenhearted. They're so far from the Lord, they don't know what they're missing out on. And when you leave from this church tonight, I want you to remember God has sending you as a messenger of His love and His mercy and His grace. But if, if you're not sincere or if you're not really filled with joy, it's kind of hard for you to convince somebody else how good God is when all you do is talk about miserable things. I really want you to remember that it's your job to carry the light, to carry the torch, to carry this light out into a dark world and tell them how great Christ is. I want to, let, I want to make sure that I am being a good friend to Jesus as He has been to me. Why don't we try to be a Jonathan? Dare to be a Jonathan. Instead of always looking for a, another Jonathan to back us up, why don't we start helping people that need help? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love You so much. And Lord, I thank You for the great testimony that Jonathan had. And Lord, I just pray that You would touch the hearts of those that are here tonight and encourage us, Lord, and motivate us Lord, I pray that You would spark something in our heart and help us to realize that we have the power to help people. You've given us of Your Spirit and You've given us Your Word. And Lord, we're so thankful for what You're doing. We love You so much. I pray that You would be able to use us at this time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.